Hello, counseling students, and welcome to chapter eight, the five stage interview. This is a pretty short chapter. Um, it's about 20, I think it's 20 slides. It's, eh, no, it's not exactly my favorite chapter. There's some good information in here, but I think there's some things that, you know, we don't have to really touch on too much, but I will kind of just go through everything at least a little lightly. All right. All right, so again, awareness and understanding, understand and become culturally competent in the five stages of the well-formed session, empathetic relationship, story and strengths, goals, restory and action. Learn the basics of decision counseling and how it relates to other theories of helping and have a good start on Rogerian person-centered counseling, as well as the empathetic relationship basics of most other theories of counseling and therapy through your awareness, knowledge, and skills with the basic listening sequence and the five stages. Listen, I'll say this. I don't really do this stuff as a practice. I have the empathetic listening skills as you will as well. Um, but this chapter I find to be you know, it's got good information in it, but it's a little bit wordy. Um, there's things in here that you read it and it just, it sounds kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Not fluid. It just seems kind of stagnant. So as I'm like reading this, I'll just kind of stop, reflect, and then just say, yeah, I really don't do this or even understand it. Um, but Rogerian person-centered counseling is a good approach. Um, it was invented by Carl Rogers. I had said back in whatever lectures that he is the one that came up with this. And basically, he was considered the most beloved psychologist to ever live. And that's because he was the type of person that could see anybody. He would be able to find value and worth in every human being. And if we're being honest, everyone has biases everyone has people that you know they can't work with or you know it's it's too close to them something might have happened within their own life or family that they can't work with a particular client so to be quite honest most people most therapists most clinicians most psychologists whatever you want to call it um can't work with everybody and that is, that's normal. So I don't want you to think at all that you have to be the type of person that has to be able to see everybody and anybody. And some new, you know, therapist or counselors, whatever you're going to call yourself, you get really eager and you, you know, you want to see everybody or, you know, not everybody does, but there are some, you know, new counselors in the field that they just want to like prove themselves and they want to do this. Number one is the only one you have anything to prove to is yourself. The only one that, you know, at the end of the day that you need to feel good about is yourself. And that means working with your clients. If you're working with clients that you're not comfortable with working, you know, working with, don't do it. So that's just my little spiel on that. So was he an amazing, you know, psychologist? Absolutely. Um, just by you know everything I've read about him and all the videos I've seen about him and his interviews. But again, he's kind of the exception to the norm and most people don't want to strive to work in his approach. But what I will say in the Rogerian, and people don't even call it really Rogerian, they just say person-centered. Um, in that approach, you wanna start that way a lot of times in your first therapy session, you wanna build that rapport, you wanna have that empathy, you wanna be able to listen to them and reflect on you know, their feelings, that's important. But sometimes that's not the only route you know, as you go deeper into counseling. And when you do this practice yourself, you're gonna see that. All right, skills in action, ability to demonstrate further competence with the basic listening sequence, BLS. The foundation of effective interviewing, counseling, and psychotherapy, ability to conduct a complete decision counseling session using only listening skills and the five stages, ability to evaluate your interviewing style and com competence, and ability to complete a full five stage interview using only the listening skills and be able to take these skills to other theories of helping 
such as client-centered therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and crisis counseling. All right, empathetic understanding and careful listening are valuable in all areas of human communication. Teaching the social skills of listening has become a standard and common part of individual counseling and psychotherapy. When you use the basic listening skills, you can anticipate how others are likely to respond. The basic listening skills rest on a foundation of ethics, multicultural competence, positive psychology and wellness, therapeutic lifestyle changes, and neuroscience. All right, so when we look at the basic listening sequence, uh, it's based on attending and observing, consists of these micro skills, using open and closed questions, encouraging, paraphrasing, reflecting feelings, and summarizing. And then the anticipated response of the client would be they would discuss their stories, issues, or concerns, including key facts, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They'll feel that their stories have been heard. In addition, these same skills will help friends, family members, and others to be clear with you and facilitate better interpersonal relationships. So even as we're in this chapter, it's almost not repetitive, but these are ideas, these are, you know, themes that you've already heard before. All of these now words are kind of starting to blend together. So, you know, all this does is it helps you have a basic understanding and knowledge, but nothing beats you actually doing the work. So it's good to understand these things, but all of these words are gonna go out the door when you're actually practicing with clients. All right, so the basic listening skills would not be effective or meaningful without skilled attending and observation skills. So questioning, open questions followed by closed questions, bring out client stories and concerns. So sometimes it's really good. You don't wanna ask a client a whole bunch of questions. Like I say, you don't wanna bombard them with question after question, but it's good to like ask an open-ended question when they're, you know, again, it depends on the situation, but they, they open up and they start telling their story. And then it's good to kind of go back and then maybe ask, you know, a couple closed questions. So things are more fluid and they, you know, and they're just vibing well. All right, encouraging, use throughout the session to support clients and help them provide specifics around their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And however you encourage is the way you encourage. There's no rule book on how you do that. It's just through your own natural style. Paraphrasing, captures the cognitive essence of stories and facilitates executive functioning. Reflective Reflection of feelings, provides a foundation for emotional regulation, enabling examination, of the complexity of emotions. And summarizing brings order and makes sense of client conversation, facilitating executive functioning and emotional regulation. So this chart here just gives you examples of different types of skills. So you've got, if you look up right here, you've got counseling and psychotherapy, which is what most of you would focus on in here. You've got management, you've got medicine, and then you've got interpersonal communication. So like with family, friends, and things like that. So this will give you like an example of open question, closed, encouraging what that looks like, what paraphrasing look like, looks like, reflection of feelings, and then summarizing. I'm not gonna read all this, but you can pause it or you can look back and read these. All right, so your basic listening sequence. Those skills need not be used in specific order. Ensure that all basic listening skills are used in listening to client stories. Adapt the skills to meet their needs. Observe and be flexible in use of skills to support the client. Use, skill, use client observation skills to note client reactions and effectively support the client. Include the skills of questioning, encouraging, paraphrasing, reflection of feeling, and summarizing. These skills are used in many settings to define problems and outcomes. Okay, so the five stages of the well-formed session, empathetic relationship, story and strengths, sto goals, restory and action, provide an organizing framework for using the micro skills with multiple theories of counseling and psychotherapy. Now, again, I don't want you to be overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, I have to remember all this. Is this what I have to do when I'm you know, a therapist or counselor, again, whatever you call yourself. Do I have to like remember these five stages? 
And the question is no. Like you go into your session with the knowledge that you know, and you just go. It's it's like muscle memory. You learn these things, you learn these words, but your action is really what is important. So again, this field is an art. You, this is something that, sure, most people that are in this field, they're driven to it. It's something they want to do. They've got that empathetic nature. They like helping people or, you know, there's a myriad of reasons why people go into this field. But it's not like a textbook thing that you have to remember. So I know I stress that a lot. And that's because when I was a therapist at first and I read all the stuff and things, I was overwhelmed. And my mentor was like, School is a means to an end. School just shows you that you did it, you checked the boxes, you got the degree, boom, boom. And everything else is what you know. It's what you're, you're made of, your heart, your passion, your story, everything like that. So just at the end of the day, don't get caught up in all the words. All right. All right, so the five stage interview structure, empathetic relationship, story and strengths, goals, restory and action. And then the anticipated client response, the client will establish a positive relationship with the interviewer, tell their story, set realistic goals, develop a new story or way of viewing issues and transfer new learning to daily life. What I do want to break and say about this is you'll hear a lot in this book. It talks about the interviewer or doing the interview, all of that stuff. Again, it makes it sound a little stagnant, a little like, like there's no, no connection there. Um, I don't like to use the word interviewing really, but you know, counseling, when you're taking a counseling class, counseling is a very structured, you know, way of doing things and might not make sense. It will down the road. Um, but you want to be able to just, again, go in there with your own style and your own way of talking and your own voice. If you notice that you are like a statue and that you are feeling robotic, this is not the right thing. You want to be able to get into your own groove, your own natural ability with your clients. So I know I'm like beating this thing, you know, into the ground, but I just really want you to understand that counseling, therapy, whatever you want to call it, it's it's a helping environment. That's that's what your job is. I'm not going to go into this. This is the five stage wheel that they talk about, the empathetic relationship, story and strengths, goals, restoring and action. These are things that you're just going to naturally do. You're not going to have to like have a notepad that says, okay, did I cover that? Did I cover that? Did I cover that? So read it for your own knowledge, but it's not something you need to get stuck on. All right, so five stages also serve as structure for decision making. Um, this is a, I believe this is something from the book. I'm going to skip this. Um, actually going to skip this and this. This is like a little story, um, scenario, whatever, in the book that you can look at. And um, it, I mean, it's good. It's, it's, you know, it's good to look at. I wouldn't say that you know, skipping through things is, um, that means that they're not important because they are, it's just not something I need to focus on in this, but definitely take a look at it. And, you know, in your own reflecting, look at the questions that they asked and, and determine for yourself, were they effective? And then how would you increase the ratings of some of those responses that you, you know, read in that interview? All right. This is more about, again, every chapter is going to have something to do with neurobiology or in the brain. So fully aware ethical base suggests the need for awareness of social justice and stress management. Toxic and long-term stress is damaging and can shrink the brain, enlarge the amygdala, and shrink the hippocampus. So again, amygdala is your, it's for like your fear, your emotions, all of that. That's where it's housed. Your hippocampus is your long your long term declarative memories. So, when we suffer trauma or stress or you know like significant stressors like that, 
then your brain is altered, which is the reason people take medications such as depression medication or anxiety because the wiring in our brain shifts. And sometimes people need that medication to kind of snap themselves back into place with the, you know, in conjunction with talk therapy. All right, environmental issues ranging from poverty to toxic environments to a dangerous community all work against neurogenesis and the development of full potential. Poverty is very linked to um, changes in brain chemistry. All right, think of the various positive and negative environments from which clients come. Clients need to be informed about how social systems affect personal growth and individual development. A social justice approach includes helping clients find outlets to prevent oppression and working with schools, community action groups, and others for change. Neuroscience research provides a biological foundation for understanding the impact of our work. Brain research helps us pinpoint types of interventions that are most helpful to each client. And again, you may not be like a brain junkie or a, you know someone that's really into that, but as therapists, as clinicians, we need to understand different elements of brain research because we have to know what you know things that have happened to our clients we have to know how that affects them and their mentality and their you know their journey to wellness so we advocate for the integration of counseling psychotherapy neuroscience molecular biology and neuroimaging and the infusion of knowledge from such integrated fields of study to practice training and research all right this is kind of the big one i want to talk about so taking notes in the session I am for it or not, it doesn't matter. I used to take notes in my sessions and now I don't. Um, it's not because I'm not um, for it. I have a notepad next to me, but if, if a client says something that I'm like, ooh, this is like, this is something I wanna remember, then I'll, you know, I'll just say, oh, I'm gonna jot this down. I'm gonna write this down. Um, I'd like to remember this. Um, Again, I'm real with my clients. I tell them, yeah, I'm probably gonna forget this. But after my sessions, that's when I usually do my notes. You know, you can do what they call SOAP notes, S-O-A-P, DAP notes, um, and they're just short note-taking strategies after a session is done. Most clients do not care if you take notes. However, you want to make sure if that is something that's going to be in your practice, you don't want to look down all the time. You don't want to be constantly, mm -hmm, yes, tell me, and not giving them that eye contact. So when you're writing a note, it should only, your eyes should only go down for seconds. Just, you'll get used to the art of writing without looking down. So just jot important things that you feel are important to remember. You do not need to write every single item they say to you in a session. So. If you're relaxed about note taking, it will seldom become an issue in the interview. Again, they call it interview a lot. Um, I call it therapy. You know, it, that is what it is. You're not going to just have an interview session one. It's going to be a continuous thing. So after your first couple sessions, things are going to be way more relaxed. But again, most clients don't even care if you take notes. And, and if they do, you can ask them, um, don't say why does it bother you, but just ask them, is there a reason? Did something happen in the past? Or, do, you know, is it a feeling of like, I'm not listening? Let them tell you what the, you know, the deal is. Obtain permission from a new client. With me, I don't ask. I don't say, hey, do you mind? I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't do that. But I may, I might say, um, I usually take notes during session. I, you know, I like to jot important things down. I just want to let you know that I'm still listening when I do that because ultimately it's your practice. Yes, you need to be cognizant. You need to be respectful of their wishes, but you know, you have a standard of what you do. All right, same guidelines should be followed for audio or video recording of the session. I don't ever video or audio a session, a real session, um, but if it needed to be done or you, you, maybe there was an intern and they didn't mind intern coming in or you know having 
their, you know, session tapes so that the intern could see it to get some knowledge. You know, again, that you need to get, you know, signed documents that they are okay with that because that is confidentiality. Too much attention to note taking detracts from rapport building and active listening. Hence, you don't want to stay focused on the notes. Write session summaries shortly after sessions. And that's what I do. Performance accountability and HIPAA are important. HIPAA, all that confidentiality stuff. Okay, now this is new. And I don't know how I feel about it exactly, how it's worded. Um, but here, here's what it says. Talking about COVID-19 vaccines with friends and family who are reluctant to obtain this type of protection is difficult. Here are helping suggestions for this type of conversation. Listen to their questions with empathy. Ask open-ended questions to explore their concerns. Ask permission to share information. Help them find their own reason to get vaccinated. Help make their vaccination happen. I don't quite understand this. This is something I would like to address with the book author because I, you know, you're always taught in this career to not impose your own values or your personal decisions. And this kind of like looks as if it's, you know, you as the therapist are trying to sway them into making the decision to be vaccinated. And there are many people that are very against it for their own reasons that are very valid for them. And I just, I don't think this even belongs in a counseling session unless they bring it up. If the client brings it up, then all these things, you listen to their questions, you ask the open-ended questions where they're coming from, but just do not impose your own thoughts on them. All right, so key points in practice. This is the end of this. Basic listening skills, five-stage model, decision counseling, social justice and stress management, note-taking, and your portfolio of competencies and personal reflection. So with that, we are finished. It's dark in here. Um, well, looks dark. A fabulous week. I hope you learned a little bit more than you knew before. So take a lot of this how you want to take it. But at the end, it's just knowledge and we never stop learning. So with that said, I will see you in next chapter. Peace.